In December 2019, we announced the first platform in the Cisco Silicon One ASIC family, the Cisco 8000. 10.8 terabits per second from a one RU box, going up to nearly 260 terabits per second with an 18 slot modular chassis form factor. When it comes to working with the DISAC community, Cisco has always looked to the best of breed software and hardware. In March 2018, we ran iOS XR on OCP compliant hardware. We broke down the steps and also several barriers along the way. This time, we flipped the concept on its head. We took Sonic, software for open networking in the cloud, and ran it on the Cisco 8000 hardware, ensuring the first enablement of Sonic on an ASIC that does 10.8 terabits per second right out of the box. It's time to take a look at how Sonic runs on the Cisco 8000, and we'll have some fun diving deep into the details. All right, so let's take a look at the demo topology. It consists of three Cisco 8201s, which are the 1RU Cisco 8000 hardware variants, and these devices are connected in a leaf spine topology. Now, each 8201 is running Sonic as a software on top of it. In addition to that, we have three UCS servers which form a Docker Swarm cluster, and this cluster will be used to run application traffic later on. Now, in order to boot Sonic on each 8201, we utilize Oni as a bootloader, and there is an Oni Pixie server within the topology as well that provides DHCP, web server, and Ansible capabilities. Our end goal is to ensure that eBGP comes up between each pair of Cisco 8201, enabling connectivity from one SOM worker to the other. And this will ensure that the video application traffic that we spawn will be able to flow bi-directionally, and we can scale that up to see how the different integration points between Sonic and the Cisco 8000 hardware actually behave. Now let's go to the Oni Pixie server. Uh, we're looking at the DHCP config file. This config file is set up to provide the default URL option in response to the DHCP request during the Oni service discovery process by each router. And this default URL will provide the Sonic Cisco 8000 image in response. Now, once we start the Oni install OS process on each device, the device will get a unique IP based on its MAC address and then get the default URL option which contains a Cisco 8000 Sonic image. The device will then download the image, expand it, and then finally install it on the system. And in just a bit on each device, we should see that Sonic gets installed, booted up, and finally the Sonic login prompt appears. Great. Now let's go back to the Oni Pixie server. Remember, this also provides Ansible capabilities. First, let's take a look at the Ansible hosts file that we've set up. This file utilizes the default credentials that Sonic provides. These are specified in the GitHub repo of Sonic as well. And the first playbook that we need is to apply the base config. Here we can see that we basically copy a config db.json, which is the JSON format that Sonic expects, onto each router. We issue a config reload. And in addition to that, we also push a public key of the Oni Pixie server into the authorized keys folder so that we can SSH into each router easily. If you take a look at the config folder, you can see that there is a config db.json and an FRR config for each router. Looking at the config db.json for leaf1, you can see that it basically sets up the IP addresses for the Ethernet interfaces that are connected within the topology. Similarly, if you take a look at the BGP FRR config, it is meant to set up a router BGP instance for autonomous system 65100 for leaf1 and neighbors with the spine in this case. The second playbook is used to set up BGP configuration on each router. And this basically copies the BGP FRR config and applies it to the Docker container that is running FRR within Sonic. 
Now we've combined these playbooks into a single playbook as seen here. So let's run the combined playbook. In a short while, all the configs will be applied there. Now we should be able to connect to each of the devices seamlessly without any password. Remember that we pushed an authorized key earlier during the first playbook run. So we, great, so we got into the spine, leaf one, and similarly, we can SSH into leaf two as well. Perfect. Now before we proceed, let's look at some of the integration points between Sonic and the Cisco 8000 hardware. We'll take a look at this on Leaf 1. If you issue a show version, we can see basic details such as the name of the image, which is the Cisco 8000 Sonic image, the hardware name, as well as the name of the ASIC, which is the Cisco Silicon One Q100, and of course the serial number, which comes from the system EEPROM. The Docker images that are part of the image are also displayed in the show version output. If you do a show platform summary, it gives you an output that was also shown in the show version, particularly the hardware name and the ASIC name. Now if we run a show platform sys eeprom, it can give you more details, such as the product name, the serial number, base MAC address, among other things. All right, so now let's take a look at some of the container processes that are running as part of Sonic. We are particularly interested in the SyncD process, which is running in the SyncD container, and it is responsible for synchronizing the network state of Sonic with the underlying hardware. Now this SyncD process links to the libsci library, which we can check using the LDD command. And the libsci library basically compiles the ASIC SDK coming from Cisco for the Cisco 8000 hardware and the Psi library that Sonic utilizes to communicate with the ASIC. Now, if you dump some of the kernel modules that are loaded up, you can see how the platform integration is actually done. If you issue the show environment command, we can see the result of the platform integration. So sensor outputs such as the temperature levels, the voltage levels from the power modules, fan speeds, etc., are all representative of how the platform integration is done seamlessly between Sonic and Cisco 8000. Now if you do a show interface transceiver presence, it shows you which ports have a transceiver present on the system. And a show transceiver EEPROM will basically dump the details from the EEPROM of each transceiver. Now let's get into the VTY SH shell of each of the routers. Here we can dump the FRR config that was applied earlier. Great, so the required BGP config is applied. We should now be able to check the show BGP summary command on each router to see if the required neighbors are up. Great, they're up. Uh, similarly, we also added the network command on leaf one and leaf two to share the worker node subnet across the topology which gets programmed into the kernel by FRR. This ensures that worker one will then have reachability to worker two and vice versa. As this topology shows, we should now be able to send application traffic in either direction. We'll start with the ping, move on to a single video, and then finally to more video stacks. Now we're on the jump host, which acts as a swarm manager, and the two workers that are connected to it these three nodes form a Docker Swarm cluster. Worker 1 is connected to Leaf 1. Similarly, Worker 2 is connected to Leaf 2.
Now since worker 1 is connected to leaf 1, let's see if we are able to execute the ping. This works. Now let's hop on to worker 2 and try to ping leaf 2. Perfect. And now because we've established connectivity across the network, we should be able to ping worker 2 from worker 1 and vice versa. Perfect. Alright, so now this is the dashboard that we intend to use to view the video traffic that we'll send across the network. Uh, these are essentially going to be individual VNC sessions into the Docker containers that launch the video traffic. In addition to that, we have the Swarm PID UI, which basically acts as a monitoring dashboard for the Docker Swarm cluster, and it'll give us some vital information about the services running on the system. Like currently, there is only a single stack which consists of four services, all belonging to the Swarm PID dashboard that we're currently viewing. Now let's start the first service. This will be a combination of a streamer that streams video on RTSP and a consumer that consumes the video across the network. We will launch two replicas of each service so that we can get bi-directional video traffic across the network. There, the services are launched. We can see them in the docker service ls command on the swarm manager each with two replicas. Now let's go on to our video dashboard, refresh the page. Great, and we see two of these sessions up. This is because a single video is playing in a bi-directional manner uh, from worker one to worker two and the other way around. All right, now let's connect to leaf one where we can take a look at some of the interface counters to corroborate what's happening across the network. So when we do a show interface counters after clearing them, we can see that around some kbps of traffic is flowing through the interfaces connected to the worker nodes. We only have a single video stream, so this is reflective. Similarly on leaf two, we should be able to clear the counters and see the corresponding count increase. There, so around 200 kbps connected to the worker node. Now back to the Swarm Manager, let's kill the services that we just launched. We'll now go ahead and launch a more elaborate set of video stacks that consist of multiple services. The services should now be down. On the video dashboard, you can see that the videos have stopped flowing. The video traffic has stopped flowing. And now let's take a look at the stacks that we're about to set up. There are about 12 stack configurations. Each stack consists of two services, a streamer and a consumer. And these stacks will basically help set up six bi-directional video streams across the network from worker one to worker two and the other way around. Great, so the services are now up. We can issue a docker stack ls to see the stacks we set up along with some of the background worker stacks that we use for monitoring. And the service ls shows all the services that were launched in lieu of the stacks that we just deployed. Each worker will therefore run a large set of containers corresponding to the services that were launched. Now let's hop over to the Swampit UI. We can see all of the services that were just launched. And the stacks also represent the stacks that were just deployed. You can see both the worker nodes are being taxed quite a bit because of the large set of services running. Now let's hop over to the video dashboard, refresh the page. And in just a bit, we should see the VNC sessions connected to each of the individual services. And there, all of the six bi-directional video streams are now being shown in the dashboard. These, these video streams are flowing from one worker node to the other. So if you take a look at the interface counters again on leaf one, 
We can refresh this a couple of times. And there are around seven to eight meg of traffic is now flowing corresponding to the video streams. Similarly on leaf two, let's clear the counters and try again. They'll start incrementing. Around seven to eight meg of traffic flowing here as well. All right, so back to the jump post. Let's remove the stacks that we just deployed. This should remove all of the corresponding services, bring down the video streams. Perfect, this was reflected in the dashboard. You can go to the Swampit UI, take a look at the stacks and the services being removed. Now checking on the workers, we can see that all of the containers that were launched as part of the services are now gone. If we hop back over to the routers, we should be able to clear the counters and see that the interfaces now basically show zero traffic flowing through them. And that's pretty much it for the demo. We were able to show an end-to-end -end workflow with a Docker Swarm cluster sending bi-directional video traffic across the entire network.